Say good morning to everyone. What an honor and a pleasure it is to be before you and to be in this body and to be in this place. Uh, let me quickly just uh, take a few moments of personal privilege uh, because of my connection with this institution and to say how um, pleased I am uh, to be connected with it. Uh, but just, just a few folk I want to mention because uh, some of you may not have, have had the pleasure of, of having some of the instructors that I had over the many years here. And I was just thinking, it's been almost 25, close to 25 years since I started a journey in Enid, Oklahoma, with uh, Phillips Theological Seminary and started that journey with Rick Lowry, who taught Old Testament. It took us a whole semester just to get out of Genesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I took New Testament from uh, Dr. Dennis Smith, and I can remember quite, it was not on my paper, but on a paper he had written it quite clearly across the front of one of my friend's paper, you still steal freely, talking about plagiarism. And so he, 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 was, he was very open about that. And so, and then uh, probably uh, Dr. Brandon Scott was the individual he went down to Mexico with and had a wonderful time. I'm glad we all got out alive, and not just from the dangers down there, but the dangers from each other. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. And then uh, President Pittman, thank you so much. You did lead me through the process of uh, attaining my doctorate of ministry, and I, I do appreciate that. And I cannot leave out um, Dr. Peluso. Uh, Gary, I, I, you know, I have appreciated you for a long time, but uh, and, and some of you know, some of you may not know, my late wife, the Reverend Dr. Thelma Chambers Young, is an alumnus of Phillips Theological Seminary, and he was so kind to come and to share uh, at her uh, celebration service, and I'll never forget the words. They were true, but they were bitingly true. They were bitingly true. He got up, and out of all the things he could have said to recognize her, he said, George and Thelma both attended Phillips Theological Seminary, and then as an aside, Thelma was the better student. Yeah. I couldn't fuss because he was right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did a, I did a lot of slipping by. She did a lot of really applying herself to be all that she could be. And uh, uh, let me just say this, Dr. Pittman, too. Uh, the Phillips Theological Seminary at that moment, some three years ago almost, that I was very pleased that uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Peluso came and did, he was the president then, but uh, to say to Phillips, they were very supportive during that period and during that time. Um, I wanted to briefly come and to share with you, um, and if, if, if you know me, if you know me, you know anything about me, you'll know that I'm not going to be here long, so you need to, if you got any, uh, Amen's in you. I know you may not be the kind to yell out amen, but if they're in you, you better whisper them to yourself right now because you'll be in class or doing something, trying to eat lunch, and they'll just slip out during that period of time. <laughs> Don't wait on me. Don't wait on me to say anything profound. The challenge to the church. The challenge to the church. Ephesians, the third chapter, the 10th verse, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You'll let me take some liberty with that, that one verse and with what I'm trying to accomplish here. It is, it is, I think, incumbent upon us that we challenge ourselves and we challenge those texts that we use to elevate, to highlight, and to invigorate those of us who work in ministry. The very term challenge to the church is a term that says it is a challenge to each and every one of us. We are the church. And if you want to challenge the church, that challenge really resides in the challenge that we apply to ourselves and each other. What difficult times we have right now. The truth has become questionable and the sources of news have been challenged not just for accuracy, but for personal expediency in many cases and not just politically. How do we differentiate ourselves without being distant? How do we claim a position in life without being away from and not involved in the actual process of living life 
those things that occur on a daily basis. We need to be involved, but we need to challenge ourselves to have a voice that lifts not just the humanity of each other, but the value of that humanity. Three things, three things I came quickly to share with you and then be on my way. One is I think that we are not in the midst of, but in need of a revival. I'm old enough to remember when we had revivals that when you had them, people had to shout and to keep up a lot of noise and had to do some things to show some signs that they had gotten some out of it. We're in need of a revival right now, but I don't know if it's that type of revival. It's sort of like what, what Sam Cooke sung when he said, I was born in the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long time a long time coming, but I know a change is going. I don't know if that change is going to come if we don't get involved to the extent that our voices are heard and our voices are taken seriously. We meld into the rest of society and just become part of it without really taking the position. Most of you know, and it was announced that I, I serve two terms in the House of Representatives, and now I, I, I'm serving in the state Senate. I, I pastored for 30 years, and midway through that, I always wanted to run for office, always. When I, I was born and raised in Memphis, and it was, it was about 1973, 74, uh, uh, when we uh, elected our first African-American uh, Harold Ford congressman to the United States Congress. It was a great moment. And all of us of color took hold of that. And I took hold of it and said, we can change some things. We can make life different because of Harold Ford's election. We were, we were in the midst of a revival, and I thought, I want to be a part of that. I knew I'd been called to ministry. I was running then. And it was all right. I, I ran until I couldn't run anymore. But it was, it was, it was a great moment for me. But I read a book by Samuel Proctor. Some of you may know Dr. Proctor. Dr. Proctor, who's dead now, but he, he worked in the Kennedy administration. And his book, uh, 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 The Mo uh, Moral Odyssey. And he talked about being a part of Sergeant Shriver, uh, uh, the, peace, the peace people, the uh, Peace Corps. And when he worked with them, he said he woke up one morning and looked in the mirror and he was shaving. And what struck him was he heard the voice of God saying, what are you doing? You are in conversations talking about collateral damage, the loss of lives. When I called you to be on the end of the spectrum to keep things in balance. And here you are on the wrong end of the spectrum and things are out of balance. I read that and I said I'd never run for public office as long as I was full time in the pulpit. And I thought, I thought, Joe, that that you know it was my time was was up, but it it came to me. It came. The opportunity came. And when I ran and I was able to run because I was no longer a full time in the pulpit, I took advantage of that. But it was it was because I saw the need of a revival. I could have never imagined that I would be in politics at a time and a moment like this. All across this nation and all even here in Oklahoma and Oklahoma City. I would never have imagined that. But we need, we need a, a revival. I almost started it off, we need a revolt. I didn't want to scare anybody that I was going to start marching and start throwing stones and, and burning stuff up. No, it really is a revolt, but, but I, I wanted to term and couch it in terms that you could grab hold of. We need a revival. I don't need you to teach me any more about Jesus. I need you to live like Jesus. I need you to show me some Jesus. That's part of our problem. We, we, we want to teach folk too much about Jesus. But secondly, not only, not only you can go on and put it in revolt now, but not only do we need a revival, 
I think sometimes we need to stop those of us who labor in these fields, those of us who labor daily, those of us who try our best to touch the lives of folk, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to give them something that they can grab hold of, a lifeline that will help to carry them, not into the next week, month, but just through the day. We need to review. I think we need to review because somehow we have gotten to the point that it comes to us that fearing excessive challenges causes us to accept mediocrity. Yet we have, we have lost our fire. We've lost our edge. We've lost our ability to not only be a part of, but to dictate some things that we ought to be on the front line dictating. Value in humanity. That's not the sociologist's job. That's our job. We are the ones who talk about the value of every human being who's breathing breath on this earth right now. It's our responsibility, not just on Sunday, but day in, day out, to emphasize and to encourage others to live lives that places a value on human life that is greater than anything else. You ought to ask yourself sometimes why. Why you are here? Why are you involved in ministry? Why do you labor in this field that really does not have the financial rewards that others, but somehow, some way, you are called to be a part of what is happening in a place like Phillips Theological Seminary? Listen, don't feel bad. Gideon had 32,000 soldiers, and God told him, just tell some of them to go back. Just quit. Go home. We're not going to have any hard feelings about them. Just tell them they're able to resign from this army and just go on back home. Every now and then, I think we ought to tell some folk. I know we're trying to get enrollment up, and I'm not trying to put anybody out of seminary, but every now and then, some of us who engage in this process need to be given permission to just go back if you're not going to put yourself on the line to do what's needful and necessary to change this world. Sometimes we ought to just decide that's, that's enough. Not only are, are we in line for a revolt or a revival, and not only should we review our own willingness, our own uh, reasons for being a part of ministry in a way that really touches the lives of folk so that we can make a difference in this land. You want to know how tough it is? Let me tell you how tough it is. I'm one of 48 senators that stay there on 23rd and Lincoln that go into that chamber. One of 48. There's only nine Democrats. They only need 25 votes to pass a bill. There's only two African Americans. You tell me when I look across that chamber and I see those who don't look like like me, I have a responsibility to stand and to talk about the value, not just of rural folk, not just of urban folk, but of all folk. I have a responsibility to do that, not just for laws, not just for policies, but for human value. A lot of things I deal with don't have anything to do with finance. It has to do with what's right. Just talking the other day. Someone who talked to me about Medicaid expansion, uh, and they were, they were couching it in the language of, uh, we have, a, we have a, a moral compassion to take care of folk, but then we have an economic need to make sure that we don't spend all of our money on taking care of folk. Well, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe that we have a responsibility to take care of folk, and our economy ought to be built around the fact that we're trying to take care of folk. If you take care of folk, folk will take care of the economy. There is a value involved in lifting humanity and what humanity stands for. Lastly, not only, not only is a revolt or revival, not only should we review but we ought to respond. I just stopped by today to tell you, we don't blend in. We don't join in. What we've got to do is stand out. We've got to be that voice that in spite of the opposition that is clear, that is there, that is evident, 
and that stands for what? Listen, I'm not always right. I know y'all think that's strange. I know because I think I'm almost, almost right. Yeah, but I know I'm not. But I know what I can do. I can stand for what is right. And when I'm wrong, I need to recognize that I am wrong and correct my direction so that I can be able to receive the insight I need to once again stand for the value of those who need me to speak up for them. I try not to blend in anymore. I try not to join in anymore. And if I have to raise my voice so that I stand out and folk will listen to me and hear me with what I've got to say, listen, I'm going to do that over and over and over again until we can claim the position that the church ought to have in society and not just to go along and say everything is all right when everything is not all right. You ought not blend in. You ought not join in. If that was the case, we wouldn't have a Martin Luther King. If that was the case, we wouldn't have a Malcolm X. If that was the case, we wouldn't have a Jesus. Jesus did not blend in. He did not join in. He stood out. He stood against the oppression. He stood against the wrong that stood and hindered folk from becoming all that they could become. I want to leave you with just that, though, because... I tell you that, somebody may jump up and say, I agree with you. But if you're going to agree with me, you need to understand that the fate of Jesus was not the fate that you are maybe planning on. You know, he ended up being crucified on a cross, placed in a borrowed tomb, had to stay there until it was time for him to enter into another glory, a greater glory, a glory that we could then attest to and have access to to be able to do and to be who he is calling us to be. And if we don't do it, who's going to do it? You know, I've decided that if we keep along the route that we're going on, we're just going to be another group that exists instead of the people that we've been called to be. Mm -hmm.